Um, as Miguel said, I'm going to talk about uh, address stability in Rust and also field projection in the second part. So my talk is split into those two parts, first talking about initialization and address stability, and then about field projection. <clears throat> the, the first part will be will involve less Rust, and the second part will, will require a bit more Rust knowledge, so uh, mileage may vary. Um, firstly, let's let's talk about why why we would want to well, use Rust in, in this case. We want to avoid memory issues, and as Gary already explained, in safe Rust we can avoid undefined behavior. Um, and <clears throat> uh, if we if we just pick out a single thing that that can go wrong, uh, initialization is is a, a thing for that can go wrong. And you would think that initialization isn't actually that difficult, but it turns out that it is actually very hard. I just looked at, at uh, a few commits here with very, very crude uh, filtering through, and I found uh, a lot of commits that had um, uh, fix uninitialized in the in the title, and they they all have have to do something with uninitialized memory or something like that. Um, the list also goes on and on, and I've I've capped it at uh, this year's issues. Um, but with Rust, we can avoid all, all of these issues and uh, we can avoid all of these extra fixes, uh, fixed patches that, that we can do. And we do this by having the compiler check our uh, code and, and ensure that our variables are actually initialized and we do not run into any problems with uninitialized memory. Um, but sometimes we, we actually do want to handle uninitialized memory in cases where we need to uh, be very efficient, for example, and initialize something directly or overwrite it directly. And for those cases, we have uh, unsafe code. And unsafe is, is a bit of a, well, word that, that might, brings a bit of connotation with it, but in Rust actually unsafe means that are, there are um, certain uh, unchecked operations that we have. And in, un in these unchecked operations, it's easy to make mistakes similar to C code. Um, so for these unchecked operations, the programmer has the responsibility of uh, taking care of that they're correct. And also this means that if we review some code, then unsafe code requires more thinking and, and more time to, to review it. So overall, we, we try to avoid unsafe code. Now, now that we have the, the motivation out of the way, let's talk about what why we need address stability in the kernel. I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar that in the kernel we have data structures such as linked lists that um, have uh, need to have a stable address because other structures point to our, our lists, for example. Um, as I was speaking about lists, a list head is just is just a, a set of two pointers which point to, to the next and the previous list heads. And if we initialize it, then we point uh, those pointers to itself. But if we now take this whole list head and move it in, in the memory, so move it to a different address, then we end up with a problem because the pointers do not get updated, but the memory that from, from which we move them is now invalid. And this means that we have uh, well memory issues. Um, and now that we want to bring Rust into, into the mix and uh, in st address stability support in Rust uh, is looks like the following. So in, in Rust from, from the get-go, all types are movable. And in Rust, we often use moves. And, and so in order to, to prevent moves, we have to use a, a special API. And this is done by pinning pointers. Pinning means that we uh, ensure that a pointee of the pointer has a stable address. And uh, we do this by wrapping a pointer type P inside of pin. For example, we can take a mutable reference and pin it by writing pin and then mutable reference. And this ensures by the compiler that the point T has a stable address until the value is dropped. And um, now you might ask yourself, how does a compiler manage this, that no, nobody can move the value? Uh, because the standard library provides the following function. This is called the swap function. This is the swap function, which takes two pointers to two values and then swaps the two pointees. So if we think back to our list head example, then this would uh, permit us to, to swap two list heads or essentially to, to swap an element in the list. And uh, this, this shouldn't be, a, we, sh we shouldn't be able to do that because that is moving, moving memory. And uh, so the, the logical conclusion that we have to come to is that we cannot give access to a mutable reference from a pinned mutable reference. So you're not allowed to, to move it because otherwise we, we wouldn't pin the pointer. 
Now, if we bring this together with initialization, we run into a bit of a problem. Um, for example, uh, consider this piece of bad C code. Uh, I'm, we first have a list head variable and then we initialize it and then we return it to the caller. But in this case, we do exactly the, the thing that we shouldn't do and that is move the list head. And so th this piece of code uh, needs to be, needs, needs to uh, emit a compile error in Rust because, well, it moves the list head. Um, and often when we try to find, when we want to find a solution in Rust, it often is, is, a, is a good idea to, to look at uh, existing solutions. And in this case, let's, let's see what C does. Um, you, you write an initializer function, which just takes a pointer to, to the list head that needs to be initialized. And then you initialize it in this function. Um, and the user needs to allocate the memory for, for this list head. Um, if we try to now translate this into Rust, then a direct translation will look like this, very similar in, in spirit. It also takes a pointer and dereferences the pointer and then assigns the fields to itself, uh, assigns itself to the fields. But if we look closely, this uh, implementation has a problem. We have two instances, of un two instances of the unsafe keyword here. And what you can see there with a the star mute is a raw pointer. That is also a piece of, of the unsafe code. You, you, it can be null and, and a reference, so reference cannot be null, but this pointer can and, and you have to check for, for all of that. Um, and let's just highlight some, some more problems with, with this use of unsafe. Who actually ensures that the, the head pointer that we get into this function is a valid pointer? It might be null, it might be dangling, it might have all, all sorts of problems. Also, uh, nobody ensures that the list head that we get as a parameter is pinned or, or stays pinned after, after what's the call. So for example, it could be a, a stack variable, you could initialize a stack variable using this function, and then afterwards you could still move it. So nobody, nobody prevents you from moving the, the list head afterwards. And another issue is that you cannot call uh, or you cannot initialize a list head without using unsafe in this case. And uh, we, we, we want people to initialize a list head uh, safely because, well, it's inside of the mutex. And if you need unsafe to initialize a mutex, then every, or well, most drivers will need unsafe code. And we want to prevent that. Uh, the solution in C is to just rely on the programmer to do it correctly. And uh, well, using unsafe in Rust highlights that the programmer needs to do extra work. And we want to avoid people from doing that extra work because as we saw from the first slide, that is very well error prone. And so uh, with Rust, we aim to offload most of this work to the compiler. Um, now to, to present this, the safe solution that, is, uh, that we have upstreamed, um, let's compare this with, with, with the solution that, that I came up with. Um, and first I'm gonna highlight some, some uh, similarities. We also have a previous and an next pointer here. And we also assign it to some, some other pointer that uh, points to, to the actual object that is being initialized. But other than, other than that, it looks, it looks quite different. Um, but most importantly, um, it does not contain any unsafe code. So <clears throat> if, you, if you write this piece of code, then you can be sure that there are no memory issues in, in this piece of code. Um, it also gives you additional guarantees. So you have to initialize every, every single field of the struct. If you forget a field, then the compi compiler will complain and say that you should initialize the field. And the struct will also stay pinned after initialization. So if you uh, try to move the struct after you initialized it, then the compiler will also complain. Uh, also, no un uninitialized memory can be used accidentally. Well just like normal, norm, normal say for us, the compiler will emit an error if you try to use some memory which has not been initialized. And an additional benefit from this API is that if you as the author of, of list head decide to only allow initializ you, you can decide to only allow initialization via pin in it. So you can always be sure that uh, an instance of your, of your type was initialized in a pin state and therefore is pinned for its whole lifetime. Um, Another very important thing of this API is that there's no runtime cost. So it's a zero cost abstraction. So it is just as efficient as if you had written the code in, in an unsafe way or in C even, and, and you, would, you would get the, the same output. The API is rather feature rich. So if you, if you need any help, just, just hop on by on Zulip and I can, I can help you or uh, any of our team members can help you.
Um, now, that was a bit abstract, maybe, and, and I'll, I'll show now I'm, a more concrete example from the, uh, from, with code from the old Rust branch that we had. And since we up, uh, already upstreamed the, the pin init API, we do not actually have this piece of code upstream, but, but only the better version that I'm also going to show. Um, and I think you, you're going to understand why we, why we wanted to have the, the new solution. So here we maybe, I'm, I'm not sure if it, it's uh, showing well, well on the Beamer, but uh, we have 20 lines of code here. And- um, Yeah, we, we can see it well, yeah. Yeah, um, and uh, I'm just gonna highlight that we have four instances of unsafe here. And you can also see that we have these safety comments that justify why these uh, invocations of unsafe uh, have all preconditions, uh, uh, well, handled, um, and <clears throat> but but it's uh, well we still have four instances of unsafe. And if we look at what what it looks like with the pinion API, then you can see we have no unsafe again. And what is important is that we also have a lot less code and no safety. And we have no need for safety comments because well we do not have unsafe code, so nothing uh, nothing uh, there's nothing that the programmer needs to manually verify, and uh, what you also might see here is we have two uh, calls for two functions in, in this example for every field of the type. So we first have some initial value and then an initializer function that or a macro that it gets called. And in this example, we only have one single call to a macro. This concludes my first part of the talk. And uh, so if, if anyone has any questions about, about the first part, then now might be a good time. Uh, how does this uh, relate, how does it interact with the standard pin traits and the unpin, uh, the pin type and the unpin trait? So um, when, you, when, you in, when, you, when you call the pin init macro, you get uh, an initializer returned and you have to actually insert that into some, um, into some memory space, for example, into a box. And then the, you will you will get a pinned box returned by by the well if you put give the initializer to the box you will get immediately a pinned box back you cannot well and that's how how we use the pin type there and uh, the unpinned trait uh, interacts with this in in the following case you have to still ensure that your struct is actually not unpinned uh, or for you for this in order to work. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead, Benno. All right. So um, for the second part, I'm going to talk about field projections and uh, how they solve a, a particular problem with PIN. And first, let's introduce the, the concept of field projections. Uh, let's say we have a, a struct named struct and with a field also named field. And we have a mutable reference to that struct. Or in, in or in more general terms, uh, some kind of a pointer, and a field projection is a way of turning a pointer to the whole struct into a pointer to only the field. So in this case, we have a pointer to the struct, and we a mutable reference to the struct, and we want to have a mutable reference to the field. And we can do this in Rust at the moment. We can just dereference or use the the my struct pointer to access the field and then turn this place expression again into a mutable reference. Um, but in, in Rust, there are many different kinds of pointers. For example, we could use a, a reference to a maybe uninitialized struct, which then uh, represents, a, a possibly un, or represents a pointer that points to a possibly uninitialized struct. And this will only allow you unsafe read access to the value. You can still write to it with safe code, but you cannot read the value because it might be uninitialized. Um, but you, because you cannot read this value, you also cannot do this projection. But uh, if, if we think about it, it actually makes very, very much sense to, to, to be able to do this projection. You just, well, the field of the struct might, might still be uninitialized, but we are only giving you a pointer to which, which can deal with this uninitialized memory. So we, we ought to be able to, to take a, a pointer to a maybe uninitialized struct and turn it into a maybe uninitialized pointer, uh, to, a, to a pointer to a maybe uninitialized field. And um, 
this last one, as I said, is not possible in Rust at the moment, or at least not safely possible. And uh, we, we actually would, would like to have that. Um, the, the problem with pin is, well, now going, to, now going to the problem of pin is, if we have a pin type, then all mutating functions of that type need to take a pinned mutable reference. Because if you remember from earlier, we cannot allow access to a mutable reference to, to, the, to the pin type because, well, it is pinned at the moment. And if we would allow you access to a mutable reference, then you could swap the value and it would not be pinned anymore. But if we still want to modify the values, uh, the fields, how do we do that? We have only a pinned mutable reference, but not a mutable reference. So let's take this, this struct as an example with a list head and a count. And this struct needs to be pinned because the list head uh, is self-referential and needs to be pinned. But do, how do we modify this count field? The thing that we can, can observe here is that we have two types of fields. Uh, the first type of field would be fields that do not require to be pinned, like the count field. And the second type would be uh, fields that require to be pinned, like the list head. And now we could actually just allow access, mutable access to fields that do not require to be pinned and only allow pinned access to fields that are, well, pinned. And in this case, we would have a special case of field projection which would allow us to take a pinned mutable reference to foo and turn it into a mutable reference to the count field, which is just a mutable u size. And uh, in the, if we want to take the list head field, then, well, we only get a pinned reference because the, the list head needs to stay pinned. Um, these special cases of field projections uh, are called pin projections because they have to do with a, with a pin type. And they depend on the intended use case, well, which, which type of reference you get out at the end, if it's a pinned reference or a, a, not a pinned reference. And yeah, they depend on the intended use case of the field and they're determined on a field by, by field basis on, on every struct. Um, as I said before, there are different types or there are other kinds of projections that we can have. Uh, one one kind was uh, of the maybe uninit, as I as I've shown before, but also one could imagine a volatile mem struct, which um, in, enforces that all memory accesses uh, are done by volatile operation operations. And this obviously also affects the fields. So if I have a, a pointer that allows only volatile memory operations, and I project it to a field, then, and I only, also only allow volatile operations on that, that should be an operation that is that is completely correct to do. And we could therefore allow projections from uh, a pointer to a volatile mem of struct to uh, a mutable reference to a volatile mem of, uh, of the field. Um, and another important usage that, that we could use for, for projection would be for raw pointers. So if we have a raw pointer to a struct, then we could uh, safely turn that into a raw pointer to a field. Um, at the moment, you would have to dereference the pointer, take the field, and then use the adder off macro to again re receive a pointer. And this is an unsafe operation, but the projection could be implemented in a way that's safe, and if, uh, therefore we would we would have less unsafe as well. And additionally, if we were to introduce a, a specific arrow operator or some some other operator, then uh, we would make this very concise and and actually easy to understand, because yeah, projections make make a lot of sense. Uh, I created an RFC for for adding general field projection support to Rust. And you can you can view that here, but I'm also going to show uh, the links on the next slide. So thanks thanks for your attention, and uh, you can follow my work uh, on, on on the RFC here, as well as if you want to use the pin init API as a user space library, it is also available there. And if you have any questions or difficulties understanding something, you can hop on Zulip and also ask in any of the streams if you, if you like. Are there any questions? I know that thanks for the talk. Uh, one question, but maybe it's just me not understanding exactly the concept of pinning, but let's say I don't use pin init. 
do I see the consequences like at compile time or potentially also at runtime? And the reason of my question is, let's say I need to review a patch. Like what, what are the best practices to see like, oh, this guy should have used pin in it instead of they did it, something like that. So I think the, the best case would be to just go to back to the example that I showed from the Rust branch. Uh, you will see it in, in the compile time, uh, at compile time because you will have to use unsafe. Uh, the, the, if you don't use the pin init API, then, then you're forced to use unsafe because you first have, the, have to give an initial value to, to, to Rust because Rust requires you to initialize everything. Um, but you have to use some sentinel values at the at the beginning, and then you have to call some initialization function, and uh, you are also only allowed to call this initialization function once. And um, you can see there that this unsafe here is because the the sentinel value should actually not not be used, and you have to first call an initialization function before you're allowed to use this conditional variable here. And uh, this is the cont uh, contra init macro, which is which which does that here. But you also need this unsafe here to to do the pin projection in this case here. So if you if you see someone uh, who who uses a lot of unsafe in their initialization, then you you might have a hint that they should use pin init. Okay, so the the flag uh, the red flag is seeing lots of unsafe. Yes. Okay, yes, yes. Thank you. That's that's the answer <laughs> that I want. So I, I'd like to add one one thing to that. Um, in, in this in this case, there was actually an awareness of of, of uh, the person who implemented this uh, this abstraction, which happen, happens uh, to to have been me. Uh, but if the person is actually not aware that they actually need that data structure to be pinned, then then that person could actually produce an API that is unsound and, and wouldn't have noticed, right? So we actually need the awareness of, of, of at least the people who are writing these abstractions uh, of, of these issues of uh, uh, certain data structures requiring to be to be pinned, right? That is, is, is a bit harder to, 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 to catch automatically, right? Uh, but, but catching it um, after the API exists is just users, uh, I totally agree with Benno. Um, it, it's either a compile time thing if you don't use spinning it and you should be using it and it was uh, exported like that way or you see a lot of unsafe uh, and that's the red flag you should fix the API. That was Watson, uh, the, the other maintainer of, of the Rust subsystem, by the way. <laughs> Any other questions? I gave the example about the field projections and the examples, the additional examples you gave are maybe on init and volatile mem, where basically every field behaves like the the entire type, right? Whereas with pin yes. projections, you really have to uh, decide for each individual field whether, whether it follows this or not. So exactly. it doesn't really make sense to put them into the same bucket. I mean, they're already great, like with procedural like pin projections and to kind of make that more ergonomic uh, because the, the the error type or the error operator does it really fit into that yes well we we yeah. have we know about the 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 crates that do pin projections already in in rust but the the problem with, with those is that they're very macro heavy and we don't have sin in the in the kernel and so we cannot really use those um, I know there's a version that doesn't require proc macros, but that has several disadvantages. Uh, other, well, one of them is that it doesn't doesn't really produce any good errors or something. Well, the errors are not very nice to read. Um, but also the the macro that implements it is very difficult to understand. Um, and so we didn't we didn't opt for for looking at that. And we think that if this is implemented on a language level, then uh, with with the error operator, then then you could you use it a lot, a lot more freely because in, in when you have a pin, when you use the pin project crate, for example, then you have to always also call p uh, project first, and then you have access to the different projections of that. But if you have uh, it baked into the language, then it makes a lot more sense. And also, uh, as you might, as you said, it, it's a bit different to have pin projections and and the other the other projections that I showed, like maybe unident and volatile mem, but. Um, I think field, field, in general field projection just just takes some kind of object and then projects to some other object and, and the parameter of the first object is a struct and the parameter of the second object is a field. 
and uh, if you view it in in this in this light, then then you can see that all of them are actually part of the same thing. And if and, and we can actually implement it in in a, in, a, in this most general way. Okay. And did you say that there's a, a, a restriction to using procedural macros in Rust for Linux? Yes, we do not have the syn crate. Okay. So, so it's like passing Rust code. It's a different. discussion about having it. Hmm. It's a discussion about having it or not, and what third-party crates we will allow. But for, for in the beginning, we wanted to minimize the use of macros as much as possible and third-party dependencies, and basically so that it can be done without relying on a lot of uh, the particle but yes the having seen another great uh, is a possibility mm -hmm. to simplify that okay so thanks a lot Beno again uh